suck it up and get through it because everyone every single dp does it like yeah don't cry about it or cry about it but just get up the next day and do it anyway <laughs> you know like that's what everyone does Welcome back to another episode of the Rough Cut Club. I am your host, Joey Nicotra, here with my co-host, my friend, my business partner, the man, the myth, the legend, Shane Reitzamer. Shane, how are you doing today, man? Great, man. I'm here with my hype man, Joey Nicotra, right. dude. I appreciate that intro. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, I'm excited for today's episode. We have uh, another DP blood brother in the house, so we get to talk all things uh, director of photography oriented with one of the most talented DPs inside of Dallas, Texas, welcoming to the show for the very first time, Mr. Jake Wilganowski. Hello, hello. Jake, man, thank you for joining us in the studio, bro. We randomly uh, got connected uh, like super briefly, just uh, at a happenstance being in the same studio at the same time for like five minutes and came across uh, this dude and I was like, yeah, nice to meet you. And then I checked out his work and I was like, holy crap, I just <laughs> met like one of the goats in Dallas. And so uh, we are definitely in the presence of greatness today. And so we are happy to uh, just dive a little bit into your story, man. Cool. Yeah, and I got to hear. I got to ask too, did I, did I look at this right? Uh, did you go to University of North Texas? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, yep. and so you graduated Sick. there. 2004. Yep. 2004. Okay. Nice. I, I arrived in 05. So I just, okay. I missed you yeah, yeah, by yeah. year. Yeah, then, yeah. Yeah, man. Well, a fellow UNT alumni yeah, is yep. all here. I still bartended up there for a couple of years after that at Rubber Gloves. So no if you way. Went and I probably served you at some point. Yeah. I, I worked <laughs> I at a drive from Dallas to there. Yeah. I worked at a um, Rooster's Roadhouse. Okay. for a while yeah. uh, which was later on uh but yeah rubber yeah. gloves is the staple bro. i don't yeah, think i've yeah, been to yeah, rubber yeah. gloves man yeah. oh, well, the, the old one is gone the new one is 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 name only sorry my ringer yeah um, but yeah so yeah it's it. a, all the bands all the is all it the close music. to the square uh off the square a little mm -hmm. bit yeah. yeah okay yeah. sick yeah. gotta add it to our spot yeah to, you gotta check it out hit, but it has yeah. changed a lot now that i guess because well the original one was a whole different building right and different everything yeah right and that's the one that you bartended at Mm -hmm. That's sick, man. That's sick, man. Bartending background, UNT similar. alum. Mm -hmm. UNT alum. Mm -hmm. And then before we started the podcast, we all, I, we also heard that uh, you guys both skate. Yes. So, I, dude, I didn't even know that, but I just <laughs> think crazy. that we breed bringing skateboarders into the podcast. Yeah, every man. time. So I, sick. It, have, you, I, have you had a lot of Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And Max first. I don't know if you know him, but do, yeah. Max was on here. And then we had a couple other skateboarders. And uh, yeah, man, there's just something about that industry that leads people to going after the filmmaking pursuit and i think yeah. it's just the background of making videos and like skate videos totally. like their whole life and then once you don't become pro you're like well this is the only other thing that i yeah, know how to yeah, do yeah. so well, plus just the self-starting you know aspect mm. of it all that yeah. sort of stuff the battle with yourself yeah you know, as mm. a dp it's like you know dps are so hard on themselves yes. skateboarders same thing yeah you know well and i tie it you know. back to like i think skateboarding is my competitive advantage as a filmmaker because like you constantly fall a thousand times yes. as a skateboarder but it's like just the pursuit of personal development it's and so climbing true. to that next level and it's like i don't feel like a lot of other filmmakers who aren't skateboarders have that type of yeah. grit that is just built into our dna to yeah like you're gonna just get destroyed and get up and just yeah. keep doing it yeah or else you're not gonna make it and it just skateboarder it just ever really mm -hmm. refines your mindset and how you look at the world and how you approach business and i feel like i approach the sport of filmmaking business and uh you know show business yeah. like i do skateboarding I and so yeah man See, and i was the guy on the uh off the ramps but i was filming so it's funny because yeah. i have the skateboard background guys but i was just the guy with the camera like filming yeah. which which was great because you guys needed me there back to Dude. when it was like all i was uh you know super eight yeah. uh, digital eight so i'd be filming I, the skaters yeah. and the uh bmxers and then i would go home and cut up video and we'd watch yeah. it you know oh man it's well, great back great in the day skateboarding filmers were a hot commodity and yeah they were, yeah like mm -hmm. sought after mm -hmm. because not Popular. everybody had a camera and so you were constantly networking with the filmers in the skate industry yeah. so that they would be down to help make you a part and, they, and mm -hmm. that one guy had like not just the fish eye, but the really good yes, fish eye. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And they had the mm -hmm. VX one thousand. If yeah. you know about that VX one thousand, then you're a real yeah. skateboarder for sure. Dude, I was yeah. showing up with the XL one S, the Canon, you know, yeah. Yeah. and I was oh, yeah. this big old thing, and I was yeah. like, All right, this is gonna this is gonna make me a lot of friends. <laughs> I remember when the Canon like T two I was like the camera that like was like, All right, we're moving into the digital space, no yeah. more VX one thousand. 
And it was like, ah, oh, man, that was a good time in life. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, dude, we could talk about skateboarding all day, but I want to get into your DP journey, man. Tell me a little bit about, um, you know, kind of your backstory and what you're doing in the industry right now, man. Yeah. So right now I'm uh, based out of Dallas, Texas. I am a um, director of photography. I do mostly commercial, commercial work these days. Um, still do films and TV shows and stuff like that, but mostly commercial work. Um, travel. You know, some here, some travel, just depends. I'm about to travel, I'm about to go to Canada. Um, so yeah, that's it, really. Mostly commercials these days. And um, I was going to do a film in October, got postponed because of the writer's mm. strike and all that stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, mm-hmm. we'll see. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm curious because uh, one, one of the things I always love to talk about with other DPs is the prep process, right? And so like so much of being a director of photography happens in that pre-pro, you know, conversation between, you know, uh, what the direction is like with the camera, the lenses, the tone and the, you know, just everything for the project. And so I'm curious when you get that commercial script that comes across your desk, what, it, what does your prep process look like and how you, mm-hmm. you know, set up a client for success? I think it depends <clears throat> For me, I mean, this is just me personally. I think it depends on the director and how they want to do it. You know, some are very involved and very, you know, notes and references and just want to talk about everything to death. And some are the opposite, you know. And so um, I'm comfortable working whichever way I need to. You know what I mean? So I kind of mold myself to their needs. You know what I mean? The director. Because it's really like I work for them. You know, the production right. is the production. Really, I work for the director. Um, the producer's always there, of course, in both of our years. But, you know, my job is to sort of interface with them, you know, in the in the way that works for them, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Because I can be flexible. You know, some people are like, well, I only do it one way or this way, but mm, I'm not like that. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So Joey and I, so I direct a lot of our commercial spots um, or interviews. We do, you know, corporate testimonials to national broadcast spots. And then Joey uh, is a DP for us a lot of the times. And so we kind of, we kind of have fallen into processes of like, Mm -hmm. okay, I get a script. Either we're generating the script or we're working in the script with an ad agency or the client themselves. And then I love bringing the DP in to like talk through the visuals and like enhance the vision of Mm -hmm. the director. So What's, what's your favorite? Because it sounds like you work both ways, right? Like some directors who want you to be re- very involved yeah. in the process. My favorite script. is when they let me do what I want, honestly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be perfectly yeah. frank about yeah. it. Um, let me be careful what I say here. But <laughs> I think there's a lot of directors that <clears throat> can benefit from leaning more on their DP, you mm-hmm. know, than, than um, a lot of them may think sometimes. Mm. There's definitely the opposite of that. <clears throat> you know, I've definitely worked with directors that are, crazy experienced. Um, but I think for the most part, I feel like the more flexibility that I'm given, the product comes out better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we just had a, another podcast with Eric Thane and talking about putting creators in a box. Like we don't thrive in that, mm-hmm. you know? So it's yeah. kind of like we, you know, yeah, there's a goal and here's kind of like the parameters of the goal, but that's what I love doing is that collaboration effort of like, look, this is my vision for it, but I know you're going to make it look yeah. awesome. And so I'm going to trust you on set. Um, so I 100% agree as much as you, you know, there's, sometimes there's like, I know I have to get this for the client. So mm-hmm. I know oh, you yeah, want to do sure. it this way, but I got to have it this way. But as much as we can, we like to collaborate on that. Like you said, like kind of like the freedom for yeah. each department. And there's so much too, where it's like, you know, you're, you're given a set of parameters to work within. Maybe that's a location. You're mm-hmm. doing something that's period. Can't look this way. Can't. So it's like, you're always in this box. I hate working in the box of like locations is a huge thing. So it's like, yeah, we can, we're doing this huge shoot, but we can only look right here. It's like, Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that just kills everything. You know, you can do it and you have to do it and you have to make it good. And if, you know, if you're good, you can do that, but that's the worst, you know, it's like, but that's like what makes you good at your job is basically taking something that's not good. And through, all the stuff you know, all the tricks you know, mm. making it something else. And man, we do that all the time. And mm. it is crazy sometimes how it comes out. You just would never know. Right. You know, mm-hmm. it's like amazing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, as a DP, like our main job is to bring a director's vision to life. Like that is, you know, what we're there to support them in all of the technical ways and, and helping, you know, bring the art to their vision. And so 
I think it definitely helps when a director has a very concrete vision and where they want to get to, but they're not as uh, they're not as precise on the destination, mm -hmm. like on the route. Totally. You know what I mean? So it's like if you tell me your end goal and where you want to end up, but let me drive, you know, yeah. to get there, like I can then bring art to that totally. instead of you doing my job for me. You let me do my job and I let you do yours, but you bring that vision to the project. Yeah. And then we both get to bring our creative strong suits to make it the best yeah. that it can be. And generally, like, you know, if you're working with directors, you have a rapport with or you've worked with before, you know, you know what pages you're on and stuff. And so it's like, you know, they'll bring you the boards or the lookbook or whatever. And it's already cool. Like you already know yeah. what the vibe is. You already know their vibe. Um, yeah. So that's the best when it's like, they're like, hey, Want it to look like this? Yeah. Like, done. Yeah. I mean, it can be that easy. It doesn't have to be all crazy. I, was, I mean, I'm <clears throat> also a very practical person. I can wax esoterically, you know, about stuff forever, but <clears throat> I, I'm also can kind of throw all that under the table and be like, let's, we're just going to, you know, we don't have to really talk about it. Here's an image. You want it to look like this? This is what, you know, how, right. we, how we get there. Mm. Some directors, you know, there's one in particular I work with a lot. He was very talky. He likes to just really go deep into the meaning of everything and all this. And that's all great. But we're still, you know, making pretty images, making a commercial, whatever it is. I don't care that much about, you know, your thoughts on this shade of blue and how what the meaning might be for this. It's like it's not a film, you know. So that kind of gets annoying to me. Yeah. A bit. Cause I guess because the longer you do it, the more experience you get, the yeah. more like you got, you already know what people are thinking or going to say, or like you already know the pitfalls you're going to be up against for this or that. You've probably already done this before. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I think a lot of times I love it when they, you know, they'll just like show me the lookbook, right. And be like, Hey, make it, make it look like this. And then, you know, if they have specific shots and all, that's great. But then leaving room for improvisation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those, that's the favorite, you know, my, my favorite collabs are, are like that. Yeah. yeah. And those are the ones that come out the best. Trust, yeah. right? Yeah. It's yeah. all about trust. Mm -hmm. I think we... And we res mutual respect. Yeah. 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 I feel like uh, that's uh, a lot of the DPs that we have on, like tr that trust thing between the director and the mutual respect too. Like yeah. that's what makes powerful because i will say direct, i don't want to i'm not downplaying directors like i just mm -hmm. worked with one recently it's a young guy and he's like really got good vision and just really really good taste it's big and um just really good vision and um you can tell that he's one of the ones that's gonna do good things and like mm. he just got he has that sort of vision that chunk of whatever you call that that not everybody has you know what yeah. i mean and it's obvious when you see it, like to me. Mm, yeah. Least, you know? mm. Well, man, yeah. you just did. Uh, I don't know if this is the same director that uh, you're talking about. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and mm -hmm. guess just because I did a little bit of digging. But you just did a project for for Hagar, um, which was so sick mm. and had people, you know, Matrix style running on buildings in downtown <laughs> and just like a super dope concept. Yeah, and uh, cool. yeah, I want to talk about that project yeah. a little bit and kind of what it took to pull that off and, yeah, and yeah. what you did to bring that to life. So that one was funny. I got the boards and um, I was looking through them and it's it like knew it was kind of a musical dance number, long form commercial for a clothing company and kind of West Side Story kind of, you know, big dance numbers. So I was kind of looking through and then I see like this guy running on the side of the building and it's kind of a younger not a first time director, but a younger guy. And, um, so we have our first call and we're kind of talking through stuff and I'm like, so we can have a stunt crew <laughs> and some, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a stunt crew. I was like, okay, okay, okay. Cause you never know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've gotten approached by people who say crazy stuff, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. just, and they just don't know what it takes to yeah, make yeah, this yeah. thing happen. That is on the page. So I was like, okay, so you things are happening. So anyway, um, yeah, that prep was basically just me, you know, the, the boards were done. The director had done the boards as far as like, um, no, actually we didn't, he didn't do the boards first. I think we went out and did a director scout. So me and him walked around Fort Worth and kind of talked about these different sequences and different sort of chunks and areas. And like, you know, I'm looking at the sun and all the buildings and the whole time. And, you know, it's a director scout. So at that time you still don't know how the puzzle pieces right. are going to fit together with days, with times, like all that. And so I'm just trying to keep it all in my head. And then 
we met again for another scout, I think, a tech scout with our gaffer and I think our key grip and production was there also. And by that time, we kind of knew what streets we could have at what times sort of mm -hmm. thing. And so basically, I mean, you know, when you're doing stuff like that where it's, you know, bigger areas you're looking at and stuff and they want it to look nice, you know, so it's like we're going to need some big lights. They're going to have to be up high. So we need lifts, this and that. So, um, it's really as simple as that. I mean, you know, on, on the, what I call the good shoots on the good shoots, it's like, yeah, you're standing right there and there's, you know, people here, people here with notepads and you're like, all right, I want a 20 K up there on a the lift, blah, blah, say this, say that. And they're like, okay, good, move on, you know? And then it happens. Yeah. They work out how to get it there, how to drive that thing in, who, freaking where to park it, all that junk. I don't mm -hmm. know. I just want the light there at a certain time. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah. So that's, sick, man. That's the luxury. I don't always give that to Joey. I'm like, yeah. you also have to figure out how to get it. <laughs> yeah, here. most of the time. I'm, <laughs> or on the I'm, strategy on yeah, that side yeah. too. But man, so I, I'm curious, um, you know, as somebody who does a bunch of different types of commercials and a bunch of, you know, even feature films and all of that, what your strategy is on picking out the camera and lens package for the type of projects that you do. And so like some DPs are very, very much um, pixel peeping, like the different lens coatings on different lenses mm -hmm. and, you know, the minutia of the different sensor technologies and different camera bodies. And mm -hmm. some are just like this camera is small and light. And so I want to use it on this yeah, project. Yeah. And so I'm curious, like what your, um, you know, what your strategy is when you're going to pick your camera and lens package as a DP. <clears throat> I generally will default to airy unless there's a reason not to. So for like extra resolution or something like that. Um, or if we need the camera really small for some reason, but generally if it's, if I'm just going to call a camera, it's going to be an airy, probably a mini LF. I own a mini LF. Um, but the reason why I own it is because I think it's the best camera, you know, aside from the things it can't do. So that's pretty much my answer really. And then a lot of times we'll have that and then there'll be some specialty rigs. Like I did a FedEx thing where we had to, the camera had to be kind of like right here above the table and do this kind of rotary dial thing. And so we got a Komodo for that, you know, sure. other little like, or other, um, small gimbals with whatever yeah. camera on it, little things like that. But, um, I am a technical person in that aspect of like, you know, nerding out on camera stuff and posts and like pixel peeping and like I do all that stuff. But, um, so I think they're, they're definitely, you know, I don't use a lot of the smaller cams these days. Like every now and then I'll use an FX six. I think I've used once, mm -hmm. I think once or twice. Um, and I've colored a project I did with that once. So that was kind of interesting to see, but yeah, for the most part, I mean, I think Aerie just looks the best in, it, I'll default to that. That's my, that's my go-to default. Yeah. Yeah. When, when looking at like the conversation of between airy and red, w do you just feel like airy has a better overall image than red? I've or? owned three reds and two Aries. So I know them very well. Um, and, and it's kind of hard to say in a way because all the Aries have the same sensor, you know, except mm -hmm. for the new one, but the reds don't, they're all different. Right. So I've had like three different red sensors um, and then there's the ones I haven't had. I've shot with a bunch too. So not, they're not bad by any means. There's nothing wrong or bad or anything about them. They're great. Um, but there's just something since I do a lot of color grading and stuff too, yeah. mm. there's just something about the way that the Alexa shifts around. And I, I don't really know. I think it's just how they encode their log or something. I don't really know what, what it is, but it just falls into place easier. You know, mm -hmm. and just like, and then whenever it's like, like when I was coloring today before I came here, a project, um, I was just doing this one shot and it just kind of fell into this place. And I was just like, damn, that looks really good. Like mm -hmm. it just looks good. And it wasn't that hard to get there, you know, and you know, I do a lot in camera, like I make my own LUTs and all that stuff. And so I'm already kind of on the way to where I want to go anyway. But anyway, so, and then I graded the crap out of red footage forever. I had a bunch of reds and all that. And some of my best looking projects have been on red. So it's not like it's a bad camera at all. Um, but you know, workflow things, the post with red, I got so sick of with doing commercials, like owning a red 
doing commercials and handing off post and just nobody knowing what to do with the files. And I mean, even big companies, little companies, whatever, it just got to be such an annoyance. And then when I started shooting more airy, it's just like everyone's looking at the same image. Everyone knows what's going on. It's mm-hmm. like there's a definite thing to be said. Like nobody cares if you're not a gearhead or a pixel peeper or whatever. Nobody cares to hear your seven step thing for getting your red into DaVinci the correct way or whatever. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's nobody wants to do that. Mm. Um, so anyway, uh, that's what made me eventually buy a, a, an Alexa, you know, cause I had some reds, but yeah, I'd say now the, the new red is great. The, um, the Talking full frame, the, the V Raptor, the V Raptor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's definitely reds best camera they've ever made by far. Mm. Um, so still some annoyances about it for sure. Um, I mean, there's annoyances about the, the mini too. So yeah, it, I just like it better. I don't know. And yeah. I, the integration that Aerie has like with their focus system with the air, you know, you on your focus, uh, the high five or whatever, you know, you, you have menu access. Yeah. It's just all mm. integrated really nicely. I love it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's a tank. You, you, know? you brought us something in all that too. And I think this is something that we've struggled with as well as like turning over that footage, you know, and then like, and people, you know, coloring it differently or mm-hmm. from what the DP's vision was when he You're was using the other it. red log. You got to use this red right. log. Right. Yeah, right. Like, so it's such a thing. So for you, how often, like, um, is that like, how do you, do you position yourself as like, I'm going to DP it and I'm also going to color it or I no. get steps of coloring? No, or cause you... like the companies I work for, it doesn't work like that. Like mm-hmm. they, you know, I'm just hired as the DP and mm-hmm. then I'm like, I'm lucky if I can get the footage mm-hmm. later, you know, like okay. I'll, I'll usually get a finished product, but um, it goes away to who knows where, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, now for smaller local stuff or whatever, then, mm-hmm. then I could do that. You know what I mean? Okay. Okay. But for normal projects, no, cause they're already working with whoever, or, right. you know, whatever they're doing. Um, is that hard as a DP? Uh, cause I know it has been in the past for Joe. Yeah, is it I mean, hard I'll for always, you to let go of that? Oh yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, I'll always like try to send some references or something, do something. Mm. I usually use my own LUTs and so I'll, you know, that'll be on the drive. And then I'll usually have the DIT, um, if he's making proxies, like burn the LUT in or uh, do a couple stills with the LUT. Just, I just try to get, you know, my, mm. my two things in there. My so it's in there as it, and you brought, down. you brought up a good point and I'm curious if you do this where like when you have a project that you want to make sure is colored the, the correct way, do you go in and build a LUT out for some of those scenes? So it's like mm. the colorist has a base to like start from. No, I'm just, I have, I have about three LUTs that I use in general and usually I won't switch them within a project. So if I, you know, it's usually one LUT and then I get most of the way there in camera. Nice. So it's pretty obvious, right. like what, you know, I don't like leave it to be shifted a lot mm-hmm. uh, in, in a way that's not completely yeah. obvious. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's yeah. like, it's definitely, I mean, a lot of times you could just leave my lead on it and it looks fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could just shift it a little bit, but there's, so, but yeah, so, but I took it, I mean, that lead has been years of tweaking, you know, right. and I finally, I haven't tweaked it now in, in a, about, probably about a year. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, so, man. Well, going back to boxes, I got to, t- I, I checked out, uh, and uh, y'all are like, where is he going with this? Uh, the, the, uh, it's the Texas general land office video dude, I that I saw. I was just going to bring that. Oh, that yeah. was the, uh, dude, mm-hmm. it's such a great video. We'll have to drop the link on the, um, to your Vimeo oh, page. Oh, oh the, the, the water one. Yeah. The water oh, okay, one. Okay, yeah. Okay, that's okay. where, yeah. The box thing. So, yes. yeah. So talk about that one, man. The challenges of yeah, shooting underwater, like, you know, and I mean, that whole thing was yeah. visually just beautiful. So, yeah, so tell that, us about that. that's a company that I work with um, several times a year and they usually bring really cool projects and the director is like super nice and just really is very like hands off. You know, he's mm. very much like, you know, I want it to look like this do your thing you know i want to get these shots you can do your thing too and like we just have a great rapport and so yeah that one came through and he's like i want to flood this i want to i want to flood a house like flood it for real like up to the people's necks Mm -hmm. and i was like well how am i going to do that and so we were looking at this um there's a water tank in atlanta Mm -hmm. that has a like a big green screen water tank i think they just use it on the chosen it's probably been in a bunch of movies um but anyway so we were kind of looking at that thing because basically we had to build a room in, in a pool pretty mm-hmm, much right. and then flood it. So we ended up in this place in Brass Drop, which 
trains um, emergency um, responders for floods mm-hmm. like nationwide. And so it's basically this giant pool, you know, that has like a submerged car in it and it has all these giant tubes and you can turn on the water and those tubes just pump out crazy water, like up, up to like white water rapids, super dangerous. Wow. And it's probably, I don't know, maybe 10 feet or something like that. So, so that's what we did. We built the thing in there. Um, we knew that, um, you know, from his references, he wanted it just kind of moody, like real pretty, but moody, you know, it's like sunlight coming through the window sort of thing. Um, and so it's actually, it was a pretty simple lighting setup. It's just a girl at a piano. There's a, there's a, on the back wall that you see, if you're just looking at the wide shots, like a girl on the piano on the right the back wall, there's a window or two, I think it's one window. And then we just put like, I don't know, maybe a 9K or two, kind of 40 feet away and had it coming through the window. And then it had like a Hudson spider up top, giving some blue ambience and a couple other little things, but those were the main sources. So it's kind of like broad lighting. And then we just would, you know, would slowly fill that thing up and, 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 you know, and get different shots. And I was on a platform with a jib. And so the jib could, you know, float right above the water or kind of swoop down and, you know, the water could come higher and I was still on the platform. And then we pulled the mini LF out and stuck it in the underwater housing, which is the first time using that, which is really cool. I think it was gotta from, be a little scary too. <laughs> yeah. My AC had never used it. And I said, Hey, this is your, I had to use an AC that I, we hadn't used a lot and he's, he hadn't used one either. And so I was like, Hey, you got to learn this thing, you know, learn how to build it. Um, I'm not going to mess with it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like learn it all. And then I'll give you the time to do it on set. Like if you say, Hey, I need 10 minutes to fix this and then you'll have it, you know? Yeah. So don't worry about it. I want you to be stressed out about it. So he learned it all, did it all that happened a few times where he's like, I just need a sec to fix it, whatever. Yeah. And it's like, Hey, we're waiting. And, um, it was awesome. It worked out great. Yeah. Yeah. The footage, cool. the footage looked sick, man. The, yeah, that the was whole, really cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that looked like a really, really fun project. Yeah, and that was, was in Bass Trip, Texas mm-hmm. that you yeah. did. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, man. and I think Harry Styles. No, not actually. Bass Trip, not Bass Trip. Um, what's near Austin? Um, is it San, maybe San Marcos, I think. San Marcos. Oh, okay. I think it's in San Marcos. Oh, yeah. Okay. Somewhere over sick. there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Harry Styles actually has a music video. That, he referenced that. That was what he I was going to say. That. I was like, now that you say that, I remember that. I had like when I saw that, I thought of that music yeah. video because yes. it was yeah. one of the coolest music videos that I had ever seen, mm-hmm. and I had never, you know, I'd never seen somebody build a house in a pool and then flood it. Yeah. And yeah, we basically copied that. <laughs> yeah, much. right, right. Well, yeah. And it, but yeah. it was just so sick. And I was like, gosh, man, like, yeah. that is a dream project. It was to cool. Shoot, I know. Yeah, you know, it was it. a dream project. Yeah. And I got my, my gaffer on it, who I love to use. He was available. Um, Pitfalls is like water, right? Yeah. Electricity, mm-hmm. big lights. Mm-hmm. So he's like, we got, we got these things called shock blocks, um, which are, I guess, expensive. I don't really know. But they, production is like, oh, man. But he's like, we got to get them. Mm-hmm. And, um, they somehow, I think it's basically some sort of breaker, basically, that goes in between the light and the wall or something. Yeah. Like trips if it gets wet. But mm. we went to lunch, and while we were at lunch, we were using a fire hose. For some reason, I can't remember why, but we were using a fire hose to add some more water to the tank. And it was like strapped down or something like that. Went to lunch, and then somebody comes in. It's like, hey, you should go back over to the building. Yeah. It's like, why? They're just like, go, you need to go see what's going on. So I went go over there and the th- the thing had popped out of its strap and it was just like going like this. And so water was like shooting all over everything, basically. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> so yeah, good thing we got the shock box. Yeah, shock <laughs> box. Listen to your listen to your gaffer. <laughs> yeah. The uh so was it a multiple day shoot? Was it a one day thing? No, that was we... yeah, that was like a let's see. So we did like a build day and then a pre light day and mm. then a shoot day. Two shoot days. I can't remember if it was one or two shoot days, yeah, but it was same. definitely like a build and then a pre light. Yeah, and I then we're working. Exactly. It was like a week. Yeah. I was there for like a week. With working with water, and I bet Joey's about I to go. All right, yeah. you, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> well, and I was gonna ask, like, you know, I've seen there. There's been a lot of like music videos that have been done, like in a pool where you put, you know, talent underwater mm-hmm. and submerge them and light them. Yeah. And typically, to my understanding, most of the time you want to just use like a big single source like mm-hmm. key uh, to light them, so you can get a really like cinematic and moody image. Mm-hmm. 
Um, what advice would you give to people, to DPs specifically, who are shooting underwater? underwater? Because that's a, that's such a unique thing that mm -hmm. we don't typically get a lot of reps in before yeah, yeah, we're yeah. assigned totally. the project. And I've only done maybe one that I can think of before that was a music video that was had some underwater, maybe two. Yeah. One. And uh, but I think you pretty much got it right. Like what, what you lose with water, <clears throat> it's just like adding a bunch of haze is contrast. And so just like with haze, um, you know, if you were to haze this room and put up a big backlight and like put your subject, like in the middle of the room or something, um, you know, all the foreground haze between you and the subject would be lit also. So is, if you can try to minimize that, you know, so like say you're lighting, you know, you have your big hard light on your person, just try to minimize the hard light spilling off into this area between you and the talent, mm. because that's what kills your contrast. Like you have it all in the background, everything like that. Like it's fine. You can see it and that's what you want to see. But when too much light gets in between y'all, when there's too much water or haze, that's when it, that's when it messes up. So try to confine it. And then, you know, most of the time people are shooting with music videos and stuff like that, like in pools, which mm -hmm. suck because they're always white. Right. So right. lights just bouncing around everywhere. Right. Mm. So, you know, if you can like lay black down on the bottom of the pool, you know, you just want to create contrast really right. is, is the simplest way to, to say it and use hard light or use like bright light. Cause it does yeah. cut it down, you know? Well, and yeah. you experience that a lot too, even just using a GoPro. Like if you take a GoPro out into the ocean, yeah. like you have the flattest image Yes. ever unless the sun is hitting at just the right yeah you like know, angle, angle. Yeah. exactly polarizer too can help too that's good yeah, man yeah. that's a good note for sure and and you brought up another thing which is just shooting in haze which is something mm -hmm. that i have uh i've struggled with as mm -hmm. a dp because one it's super hard to control like yep. you're constantly you know shifting uh, uh or the level of haze in the room is such a hard thing Always, to yep. constantly manage and so it's I'm, always a battle you and, know? Um, yeah. i'm curious what advice like just in that whole world of even just shooting with haze yeah. you have to to monitor levels to to monitor the light that's hitting in front of yeah. the haze like are there well any, the, yeah. the basic um things that everybody knows is like you know you got to turn off the air conditioners you right. want to keep the stuff in, in the room so and if you can create create a sealed room and if you're using like pro style haze um, if it's sealed up, like you, you shouldn't have to redo it very much. Like you can, you can, I usually overdo it and then let it settle, you know? And then once it settles there, if you're in a closed box, you can put the thing on like barely on, right? you know, just barely on. Cause or, noise is also a thing too, if it's yeah, too loud. Yeah. And like it can just small. be barely on and like, it'll spit out, you know, every 10 seconds, like a little tiny poof or something. But, um, the other lesson to know if you're in a smaller space is like less is more like it's always too much haze is always bad. like a, a little goes some such a long way, but you do have to, for sure, like just know that it's like, you're going to have to adjust the contrast levels and posts. There's no way that they're going to match through every shot. Yeah. Um, a lot of times if you're in a bigger space, what you can do is just haze the background. Right. You know, and that works really well because like I said, then you don't get all that in between your subjects. So right. they're nice and clear, but then you still have, the atmosphere. Um, I used to worry way more about the haze and the haze levels. I'll say this in commercials. It's not as much as a deal because shots are shorter. They're shorter and you're never really doing a sequence. that's, that's long, you know, that right. long. And mm -hmm. for features, it would be, uh, I'd be much more involved and then I would be metering it and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But it's all this sort of stuff that you already know, where it's like you would just find an area of the set that's off to the side, not contaminated, Get, you know, put a little light there yeah. and then meter it. You know, you can meter the beam. If you're in a true black space, you can just like look through the beam and meter it. it depends on how technically you want to yeah. get it. Honestly, I mean, for the most part, it's, it's, I do a lot of it by eye and just by feel. And I've just looked at it so much now that I can, I can tell yeah. instantly if it's like, oh, it's a, and it just needs a little less contrast right. or a little more. It just, um, but it just comes with like doing it a lot, I think, you know. Love but it. I, I don't really have any big secret for it. There's really not. It always is a thing. Um, but I will say this, like it elevates your work so much. If 100%. you can use it. I mean, people don't realize how much it gels everything together. And especially if you're using a camera, any of these newer small cameras, like anything that just has any sort of little, you know, 
a little plasticity to the look or whatever it is, like haze helps all of that so much, yeah. so much. Mm -hmm. Same thing with vintage lenses, same sort of thing, but major. Like it'll elevate your work if you just be like, I'm going to use it on every shoot for the next two months. Yeah. You know, like no matter what. I love you it, know? man. Yeah. You, you brought up vintage lenses. Do you use them a lot or do you have a go-to lens that uh, is not vintage that is like one of your, you know, go-tos in your kit? Yeah. My, um... I own a set of rehoused, really nicely PL rehoused contact, Zeiss contact Sick. lenses. Um, I don't know anybody else that has them in this rehousing, but they're, you know, about 45 grand or so. All the best sets, you know, all the gems. But I love those lenses because you know, just the way that they look is, is beautiful. So those are sort of my go-tos, and, and I own them as well. And I have them in EF and PL. Um, but at other lenses, it just kind of depends on the project. Like if I don't like clinical lenses, unless there's a real good reason to use them, you yeah. know, then it's like, whatever, who cares? Uh, if there is, it's usually something boring yeah. anyway. Right. Right. Um, so, um, but as far as the vintage lenses, I mean, I like it all. I like all the funky yeah. lenses and, and all that stuff. Um, I How like do you pink rose a lot. I like, you know, super, super weird. Yeah. Like, Kawa anamorphics. Like yeah. I started a movie on those. It was great. Um, how do you feel about the DZO Vespids? Because they're I've, kind of a, I used one, I had one of those lenses once, uh, on a shoot and I think is we needed like 135 or something yeah. and we had like some set and we just grabbed that one, but I haven't really used them, Word. but I think they're probably, you know, fine for a lot of stuff, you know, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I think they're definitely a disruptor yeah. in the industry. Cause they kind of, they came out and then started putting thousand dollar, like high quality, glass into the hands of creators which oh, yeah. i thought was like super and sick. now it's like there's so many options out it's just like totally left and right there's stuff coming yeah out. i'm 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 trying to decide on if they're like a clinical lens like they're too clean or if they're just like a great like go-to kit yeah. so i was just curious but i'll uh, say this yeah. though i mean i personally like because i you know i messed around with all those kind of cheap uh lenses that are out now just you know, broken on just all Sierra those sort of anamorphic yeah or stuff, like yeah. even sigmas stuff like that and um i still think like the even though it sucks to work with them but like vintage photo lenses canon fds like those that glass is just all that glass is so much better yeah. like mm -hmm. like the contacts glass is so much better than like the dzo glass and stuff mm -hmm. like that like it's just a different thing and so anyway you know a lot of people are jumping on all these sets now because they're so affordable and great and, you know, get the mechanics and all that. It's definitely a plus, but you can see the difference if you stick on like a nice piece of cannon glass or yeah. a nice piece of, you know, something like, I also have a set of like the iron glass Russian lenses, you know? Okay. Yeah. yeah so yeah. like if you put on one of those and then put on like a contacts and then put on like a Sigma, cause I have all the, all those, um, just wildly different. And, yeah. um, this ice just looks so much better. It just yeah. looks cinematic, like yeah. instantly, you know, yeah. just the, the fall off. So anyway, uh, I'm a big fan. So I, I like all these rehoused. Um, yeah. I've been shooting with these like Nikons that are rehoused um, recently that 444 camera had. They're super cool. Some FDs recently as well. Um, I did a shoot with, uh, it's about to come out with um, Meg the Stallion, which is really cool. Whoa. But we went up to New York and um, got a set of FDs and, Random wide open. It's How is it shooting really with cool. Meg? Because she's, she's in the cool. middle of like all this crazy. Yeah. Like we had her security was. I was gonna say like big. right now she's dealing with a lot of crazy lawsuit mm -hmm. stuff, and so I, yeah, you know. it definitely it definitely was a thing for sure. Like there, there was a lot of security that they didn't yeah. plan, that production didn't plan for. You know Dang. that once mm -hmm. we got there, they're like, oh yeah, no, we're gonna yeah. have to have like thirty. Yeah. This and yeah. Mm. Well, and you just did a pro. I guess this was a little bit ago, but you also worked with the Beebs, man. You did oh, yeah. one with Samsung and, and, and Jay um, Beebs. What was I going to say though about Meg? So Meg, one thing that was cool about her is like she, she was like, I like I don't really get starstruck, you know, at yeah. all. Um, but there was something about her where she's like, just so cool. Like you know what I mean? Like she just had this like real coolness factor, and like she talks real fast. And just like, you just kind of are like, man, I want to, you want to be like on your game. I don't know. Some, I wasn't starstruck with her, but something about it was different. Like she was just, I don't know, really cool. Next <laughs> level. Yeah. Next level. But yeah. Do yeah. you, you gotta, is there like some level of starstruckness though? It would be working? with musicians. It would be like if I interviewed or if I, you know, I did a project with some, 
um, musician that I really like yeah. or something like that. You know what I mean? But like an actor. Yeah. I don't know. Not, not so much actors I can think of yeah. you know, that I would be like, oh. yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, and I just got to like, if I was shooting for Justin Bieber, or just like trying to give him direction as a DP, like there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. It's uh, funny. And everybody's so different too. Like, you, you know, you just never know what somebody's going to be like. Um, and some people are, a lot, most people are real chill, you know, yeah. and real cool. And, um, and then some that you think would be are just not. And there's like, yeah, cra- crazy high strung. And, but for the most part, people are cool. Yeah. Mm. Tell me about Ricky. Oh, Ricky? The yeah. Rick <laughs> Ricky's awesome. I just got a boat seat for him. For, for those that don't <laughs> know about Ricky, talk about Ricky. Yeah, and so what Ricky that is. Is, a, is a rickshaw. So it's like basically a cart a really cool cart that you can sit on with your camera and somebody pushes you around. So if you're doing like, um, you know, somebody running or just anything like that, you can use that as a dolly. You can, you can, you don't even have to ride it. You can rig the camera on it. You can do all sorts of stuff. But anyway, his name is Ricky. He's a rickshaw. I just modified a boat seat and put that on him. So Mm. it's cool. Dude, I gotta, I gotta, you can use them for all kinds of stuff. It's, it's pretty useful piece of equipment well we'll saying. throw a uh, yeah. a link to uh, the photo that uh, mm-hmm. joey's trying, I'm, I'm to, trying find. to find it like in yeah. the studio right now because it's so sick but i, I can't <laughs> yeah, find we'll, it on the fly we'll but. throw we'll throw a link up it's uh it's pretty awesome Dude. i think i've seen it in action some of the bts stuff mm-hmm. that i've seen yeah uh, it was on that we used it on the hager yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a great that mm-hmm. was a great bts uh featurette too that was on yes, there yeah, yeah that was james did an awesome job on that yeah and, that was um, it's like everywhere every time i turn around james is filming there so he's like yeah, he's, he does a good job. Yeah, yeah, I saw a lot of gimbal and rickshaw work on that. That one, you. going back to that job real quick earlier, because you were asking about it, the um, with the planning and stuff. So that one um, was definitely a logistics nightmare, sort of, mm. because of, you know, we could only shut down certain streets at certain times. We had to deal with the sun and where that was going to be and how it was going to be blocked by buildings at certain times. And then getting the lifts with the lights in the right spots at the right times and everything. But, um, so you kind of plan it all out and then, you know, you just wake up on the morning and you're like, hope everything goes great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, you know, you walk to that and you can't, you know, me personally, I used to get so nervous and all this and that. And I just don't anymore. It's like, because basically everyone's there to like, everybody knows what they're doing. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. it's, it's going to happen. You know what I mean? Like it's going to happen unless something insane happens. Like we're going to make this thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so you just kind of got to like chill out and just stay calm and like put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And, yeah. And I was going to say that as a DP myself, there's, there's been so many times when it's like, okay, weather is doing the exact opposite of what I want it to do. Or, uh, we've had people, you know, leave set to go to the emergency room before and like just crazy things that you cannot plan for. And so I'm curious, like what advice you have for DPs? Like when the sky starts to fall on set and everything that you planned in pre-pro doesn't go accordingly. Like what advice do you have for DPs to like make their day and, and, and still stay level headed? Well, the, it's always like, you got to ask, it's usually you and the director, it's like you director, AD and producer all get in a huddle and it's like, okay, what are, what are the must haves? So it's like, what does the agency have to have? You know what I mean? Because there's always going to be for 10 shots, there's going to be like three that are must haves, you know, no matter what we got to get these shots. So we figure out what those are and then figure out a way that using your experience and hopefully, you know, the other people on your crew figure out a way to, to get them in a way that, but man, you it's, it's amazing what you can do. Like I could show you shots where, I was like, it was pouring rain in this shot right now. And you'd be like, what? It looks mm. like a sunny, like I did a shoot with this girl skating down the street. It looks like a sunny day. It was cold, raining, you know, but so there's so much. It's just about using the camera and the lights and the perspective in the right way. Mm. That's what's so cool about this job. It's like a puzzle, you know? I love yeah. that, man. That's good. Um, one thing that is always interesting to me, because I'm, I'm, I'm on the outside looking in here, but you're a union member. And now is an interesting time to be a, a, a union member with just all the strikes and everything going on. And mm-hmm. so I'm curious, um, you know, from your perspective, how you feel like being a union member has impacted your career. So it basically opened me up to jobs that I wouldn't be able to 
that I wouldn't be up for, wouldn't be able to take otherwise. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's always like, when do you join or should I think about joining whatever, you know? And then, um, basically whenever I got my first offer that I had to turn down because Texas is a right to work state. So technically you don't have to be union to work here, but if you're going to work on a big job that's coming through, like a giant commercial, like a lot of times they're going to be union people anyway, and they're not really supposed to ask you, but it happens. Um, but yeah, I don't remember what it was, but there was a job that I, that I missed that I couldn't do. And then I joined and then right after that, I got a job. I think it was a cam op job, like right after that, but just for like a bunch of days. And so, you know, that covered a lot of the fee right there. So it was, it just kind of happened in an organic kind of right time. But yeah, that's all it does basically is this, and then you have to pick as a DP, it's different for different unions, but as a DP, you have to pick your second city. So it's like Dallas, and then you have to pick West Coast or East Coast. Um, and then, if you know, if you're on the West Coast, you can't work over there. Right. You know, so I'm in the East Coast right now. And so whenever I was working out um, in California recently, did a thing with Doritos for, with Kiki Palmer, who's a pretty big star. Yep. I was working under a pseudonym. And, mm. um, the unions all came out, <laughs> all of them Dang. came out. Yeah. yeah. But the production is really good and they were treating everybody really well and paying everybody really well. And so, you know, everybody was like, Hey, it's all fine. And, um, but yeah, so it's, it's annoying to me the the union thing with the coasts, because I want to work, I want to work where I want to work to be frank. Yeah. You know? mm. Well, <laughs> I- and it's an, it's an old thing from, and you know, I also, I also think commercial should be a separate thing almost because like we don't need to be constrained by like stuff that came out of movies, mm. you know, the whole union system, that's all from movies and just all that business from back in the day. But, um, I understand it. I get it all. Like I understand the protections and all that. Um, but just for me in my life, it's annoying if yeah. I can't take a job or, you know, have to like do something kind of right you know, under the table or whatever it is. It's like, I just want to make, I just want to work. These people want to hire me. I want to work. Yeah. You know, speak, speaking of working, you, you've worked on some, like looking at your Vimeo page, looking at your body of work, you've worked on some really uh, awesome commercials, ad spots. And I know we're going to get to talk about the feature here in a second too. And Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to talk about that, but um, what would be your tips for up and coming DPs? I mean, is, is joining the union uh, one of those tips? Is networking, like what kind of, what was your come up from getting more and more jobs? Yeah. So I was definitely like, you know, a slogger. You know, I've been doing this for a long time and I moved it throughout different areas in the industry. So like when I started out, I was doing a lot of like corporate mm-hmm. and um, TV shows, like television, like, travel channel, discovery channel, that sort of stuff. Mm. Actually. So I started out doing like, you know, little cam jobs for them, not even DP, just like B cam or C cam or whatever. And then, then started like DPing those kind of things. And so did a ton of traveling for those networks, like discovery, history channel, travel channel early on in my career. And then at the same time on the side, I was doing like, shorts and music videos, you know, with my friends and I was real involved in music then. And so, you know, there came a point where it's like, I don't want to do this TV stuff anymore. You know, I love this other stuff. I'm doing the cinematic stuff, but you know, it doesn't make money. This makes money. I'm already like established. Like they're calling me all the time now. Like I could have just kept doing that and been, you know, who, who knows where, but, um, so anyway, I made a conscious choice to, to try to sort of get in more of the commercial market. Right. So my story is that one of the, I did a, a, I remember how this connection came about, but anyway, a friend of mine called and said, Hey, I have a friend who's uh, got a toadies music video. Mm. And so I want to put you guys in into context. So he called me, Justin Wilson. He's like, Hey, I got this toadies music video. I was like, cool. Um, we did it. It was awesome. So that started our relationship. We did a bunch of music videos after that. Um, and he got his first, at that time, he was a editor at a, town, a place in town called Tango, Charlie from Tango. And he was a junior director and he had got kind of his first kind of bigger commercial or one of his first. And so he brought me onto that. And so that like introduced me to, cause it's really about like getting in the right, you got to meet people. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Right. 
Mm-hmm. Everybody's, you know, it's just, it's like a human business. So then I like met one of the first commercial producers in town and met a few, you know what I mean? So and that mm-hmm. started the thing, you know, and then I just slowly weaseled my way into that world, started turning down the other jobs, taking these jobs when they came. A lot, basically like a lot of the work that I did in music videos and shorts, like on my own, got me, got the people that were in the commercial market interested in me. Now it's different. Like this was probably uh, 12, 13 years ago, something like that. I feel like now it's just easier almost, you know what I mean? To just get in. Just everybody just seems more open. It's like, I don't know, but maybe not. I do feel like though, that when you are in the music video (sighs) space, it allows you to create a lot of different worlds and exactly. scenes that are enticing and attractive totally. to the commercial director. And you cut that little reel of all your best shots. And man, Absolutely. that thing looks so good. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I did that forever. And that is what got me some of my first stuff. And then you go and shoot the commercial and it's like a vacuum cleaner commercial. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you get paid really well. Right. All right. right. <laughs> um, That's awesome, man. Yeah. So, and then just slowly, you know, you, you try to, what I've found, and this has organically happened, but it's like, well, not really organically, but like the stuff I put on my website is kind of the stuff that I like of the shoots that I get. You know what I mean? So like I do, like most of my work is not on the website, you know? Mm. Um, I, I want to dive into that too, before we get too far away from it, yeah. because I think that's something that a lot of DPs struggle with is that so much of the work that they create is not work that they yeah. show And then they off. call and be like, hey, well, do you have any you know, happy family. (laughs) And I'm like, well, I've shot like a million of those, but I don't really have them. Right. That happens. So like, so how do you balance even just that mentally where it's like most of what you shoot, you're in a sense, not proud to show off. I think it, it, you just keep going. That's what you do. And then you get to, you finally get to a point, hopefully where it's like the projects you get are pretty cool or you can be more selective because you're getting paid a lot more. You know what I mean? So there is no magic answer to that. It's just suck it up and get through it because everyone, every single DP does it like, yeah, don't cry about it or cry about it, but just get up the next day and do it anyway. <laughs> you know, like that's what everyone does. I love it, man. Yeah. I think that's the t-shirt right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't cry about it or cry about it, but just get up and do it the next day. Yeah. That's great, man. That's so good. Yeah. But it's, it's so true. It's like, we're our own harshest critics yeah. by far. Yeah. You know, nobody likes their own work. Everybody mm. thinks they're, you know, not going to work again. And that job was their last job. And, you know, everyone has the same, the yeah. same things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's a lot of comfort in, uh, uh, what is it? Misery loves company. And yeah. so <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot of comfort in that statement for sure. But, uh, on the note of really cool projects, you did a, a really tight feature by the name of bomb city. And so I want to kind of get into that and yeah. how you got, um, that gig and just, you know, some of the details behind it. So bomb city, do you remember how I met those guys? <clears throat> Speaking of which, uh, Major Dodge mm-hmm. was on. I, th- I think he was a producer mm-hmm. yeah, he was on, a producer. right? Mm-hmm. And uh, he was actually in a short film back when I DP ah. best in the DP world. But I met him. He was an back actor. The, okay, he was yeah, an he actor. still acts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he's great, man. So uh, and I saw that. So I actually saw when, and that's where I first I saw just, your name because I saw yeah. uh, Bomb City coming up. And man, by the way, I just rewatched the trailer again and, and shame on me. Like, I can't wait to watch this film. I'm yeah. going to watch oh, it. You're like, it's good. It's yeah. so gritty. Like mm-hmm. the, it's beautifully cinematically shot, but like in a grungy, gritty way, Yeah, all these night scenes, flashlights. I mean, mm-hmm. dude, you crushed I just remembered it. now how we met. It was through major. Like, I think, I think mm. I'd done a commercial major was a, uh, an actor in it or something. Ah. And then I think he told Jamie and Sheldon, the Jamie's the director. Sheldon is, producer writer they mm-hmm. both wrote it um i think he was like hey you got to check out jake or whatever and that's how we hooked up and then jamie like we were saying before big bmx guy mm. you know would you know do like 12 stair handrails and stuff so he's kind of in that world that story was out of there from their hometown basically it happened when they were younger and so he sent me the lookbook and i was like jamie has great taste and he's a fan fantastic uh, graphic designer. So his lookbook was like crazy. Like it mm. looks so good. And I was super into the style. Like definitely we're just like right on, right on board. And he's very much like me as far as just like how we communicate. He's very much like a, um, 
like his motto is like whatever it takes like we're just gonna do it like mm. that's just like how he's just sick besides bmx it's like that yeah. skate bmx it's motto it's just motto, like we're just bro. doing it like we're gonna yeah. we're gonna go do it we're going let's go yeah <clears throat> so anyway so that's how that came about and then you know we just had i think we had a month of pre-pro where they had an office and i would just go up there periodically and we'd chat about stuff surprisingly we didn't for that movie, I mean, it was kind of loosey goosey. Like we we knew the scenes we needed. The dialogue was definitely written, um, but as far as like, it wasn't like okay, slow push in here. It wasn't like that. It was kind of like the scenes were there, and then, which is I think the best way. I mean, ideally, how you want to work is like if you know you don't get this because of time, but generally, what you want to do, the right way to do it is like you get in there with the actors and the director in the room and they run the scene. They, they do it. They act it and you watch it and you figure out how you want to shoot it. You know what I mean? And then you light it and then you shoot it, you know? And so that's kind of what we did. You know, did y'all have a, like a shot list or a storyboard for that? Cause it sounds like mm-hmm. you did. No, we def- definitely did not storyboard the whole movie at all. It was more like, um, like a loose shot fight, list type you know, fight. Cause it was like fight, you know, parking lot fight scene. Um, Interesting. And then the script. Right. Mm-hmm. But I don't remember there being boards or anything like that. And yeah. so how do you feel on like the whole shot list versus uh, storyboard conversation in general? Because I, yeah. I have an opinion on. I think it can depend. Yeah. I think it can depend. I think um, I think it really does depend. And I don't mean that as a cop out answer. Like I think there's there's definitely jobs where it's like you shoot the boards exactly. And it's great. You know what I mean? Um, talking commercials. Um, so I think, I think it just depends on the project, like what, what the project is like, what the intent is, all of that just depends. You know what I mean? Um, and how everyone works with commercials are different because there's so many layers involved because it's not just you and the director. That's the deal about narrative. It's you and the director. Nobody else matters. Whatever they say, it doesn't matter. It's really all two. And that's it. But commercials, it's like the exact opposite. It's like mm. 50 agency people and <laughs> clients yeah. Yeah. and the director. Yeah. Somebody yeah. phoning so in like, from across the world yeah, exactly. on a Zoom yeah. call. Zoom Let me in. see that. Yeah. Yeah. Making exposure choices yeah. with the Zoom feed. That's <laughs> yeah. awesome. Love that. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, so I forget I had a point here. But anyway, yeah. Now my point is that, yeah, it just depends. I think um, I'm comfortable being loosey goosey. Sometimes you can't be obviously if you're using big stuff and have big setups. Like it's 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 the age old answer that you've heard a million times on every podcast. Like have a plan, we have room for improvisation, but it's true, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I I think that there's something at least for me in finding the shot. Like once you once it's been blocked, you get to watch it, and then you can really you know see like okay, is that you know, 25 millimeter going to really work here? Do I need to like flex and change it up and like go in tighter on this moment? Or do I need to do the opposite? And do I need to, you know, use a wide lens, but push in on the subject or something like how it, how it changes totally in the environment. Once art department does their thing, once you see like kind of a loose, you know, interpretation of what the actors are going to do. Yeah. Yeah. And you may, you may not know about some foreground that's going to be there or some background that's going to be there. And it changes like, you know, once you actually see it, I feel out the, For sure. I have a loose shot list when I go into it of like coverage that I know I want, but I'm super open to flexing once I actually get in the space, seeing the shot blocked. And maybe I just want to let one angle breathe for a little bit, yeah. Or, yeah. or, or maybe I want to take that fight scene and break it up into a, a bunch of different pieces or, you know, whatever yeah. it is. And so I'm always interested to hear how other DPs work in that. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that was interesting about bomb city is since there was so many scenes with a lot of people involved and kind of chaotic scenes, like very chaotic scenes. Um, it's a small miracle that it came together the way that it did. Um, and that we weren't missing like giant pieces of coverage or anything, but we were just kind of in it. Like we knew, you know, we just kind of knew what we needed for the scene. And then Jamie, the other thing I'll, I'm jumping around here, but the other thing I like about commercials um, back to sort of pre planning and stuff like that and shot lists, like, I do like it also, like, uh, I like it when, I kind of like it one or the other. Like, I like to either be, like, a lot of freedom and let's figure it out, or very specific. Like, I like things where I have to recreate, like, a very specific style. That's cool. I like doing that. You know what I mean? Because you're, 
that's that's what separates a really good DP from a not one because you're like, you know, making all these different like emulating styles basically. So that's really cool. I like it when there's like a commercial or something like that that has like a certain vibe or tone or just, you know what I mean? And you have to live in that specifically. I think that's cool. So, yeah. I love I love hearing those perspectives and and from a a director's side, I I actually love uh I love the like you're saying the freedom of it on set because I in the in the shot list well, like you were saying is coverage for me. So I'm like, "Hey, I know I need these shots to tell the story that yeah. I'm trying to tell here." But I'll be honest, when, even when like we were doing this um broadcast spot for a boot company and we were driving out there and we're doing <laughs> uh, one last pre-pro meeting, we drove together we're talking through the shots and I'm trying to download like what I'm seeing and he's repeating it back and he's coming with his ideas. But then when we get on set, those shots didn't look like anything that was in my mind. Mm-hmm. And that was okay though. And I think that's where that creative mm-hmm. freedom and trust comes. I'm like, dude, I want you to understand like what I'm trying to do with a story and vision. But when you get there and I look at the monitor and I go, dude, that's not, but yes, a hundred percent. You know what I mean? And that's totally. the freedom that we like to, and that's to great. Have like, set. and there, there's some people that, that don't like that sort of change. Like mm-hmm. it's great when directors are like that, you know, the it's, it's terrible when they're the opposite, you know, mm-hmm. when they're like, well, this isn't what we planned at all. And it's like, well, yeah, it's cloudy day now. It's not sunny. Right. Like mm-hmm. it was supposed to be, um, you know, that sort of thing, you know, but it's like, we're all here to make the same thing. So it's like, you know, right. you get, sometimes it's like, it doesn't matter what you think. It's like you're presented with this and you got to make it good right. with mm-hmm. what you're giving. Got to make mm-hmm. lemonade from all lemons. The tricks. Yeah. 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 Man, I do that so much. Just like, <laughs> so, speaking of uh, <laughs> lemonade and lemons on Bomb City, what was like the biggest challenge that you were up against? Like uh, a specific situation or a scene or well, those overall? Big fight scenes were were mm. intimidating just because it's a lot of people to wrangle and it's like very chaotic and you're just like, and then you're looking every direction. So you're like, where are you going to put the lights, you know, and um, all this sort of thing. So those, and then there was a couple like, what about the car scene too? Like, like the, the, the like car the scene. Car cra- and like, Yeah. Yeah. That, like the run over. Yeah. Part. Yeah. Like that, those, that was weird. Cause like, we weren't sure how we knew how we were going to do it, but you just never, we were like, is it going to look, Good, right, yeah. right. But um, it did look good, yeah. And and when we, because we watched it back right after we did the take of when yeah. he actually rolls over the guy, and um, I mean, I'll I'll say this though, it's like, you know, there's certain lens sets like cows are one of them. Like they're so messed up and weird that's like you can almost point them at anything and it looks cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, that sounds stupid, but it's kind of true. Um, like if you're going to shoot something, you know, if you're just like shoot this can on this white table with no lights, like right here and you can have one camera and one lens, it's like, well, yeah, give me the craziest lens ever, you know, cause it adds so much right there. Yeah. Mm. So there was a lot of that, you know, like those lenses are nasty. They fl- they're flaring from every direction, you know, so it helps like gel stuff together and hide stuff. And, but yeah, I think the, the big fight scenes are probably the most intimidating just because it was like, how are we going to do this? You know? And on the very first day, it was a really big day. It was a night shoot. And we had a, it's in the beginning of the movie. It's like the guy walks in the warehouse. It's this long follow. It goes all the way through the warehouse into this mosh pit scene, jumps in the mosh pit. And it was so hot. Our B cam operator almost passed out, like literally. Um, and this was day one. And like, I'm in there and it's going crazy. And I'm just like, God, this is freaking nuts <laughs> you know and like uh mm-hmm. it was cool though but like it was my vibe though because that's like what i would do it was like back in the rubber gloves days i was in a band for like 10 years like everyone was sweating and jumping all over each other and i was just right there with the camera and, and like that's when you're just like oh yeah this is the stuff yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is fil- this, this is, is when you're feeling like yeah, I, I, yeah this is i like doing this yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. Th- yeah. there's a certain moment when you're filming certain projects where you feel yeah. yourself come alive yeah and it's like, you know, you are in the middle of a moment where you are creating something yeah. that is so fulfilling, yep. like <laughs> whether it ever sees the light of day or not, like this is the stuff that you create for. Yeah. And it's such a sick moment to be in. But 
dude, the the battle scene or not the battle scene, but the fight scene that y'all did. I did a battle scene with like eighty extras, and that was like oh, one because you did like a period movie. Yeah, right? it was like yeah. a period piece, um, and there was like a battle scene with like eighty extras, and it was such an intimidating mm -hmm. like scene to like go to and be like, all right, how can I? Like make this, you know, continuous and like place the lights and then, yeah. you know, get the coverage that I need. And, you know, even just helping the director find out the order of the day that you need to bring all these people in. And then, yeah. you know, there's a lot of like logistics that you have to, you know, kind of help the director bring yeah. it to life from a logistics standpoint totally. because you know what it's going to take. Yeah. So I'm curious. And hopefully, there, well, usually there's an AD there, then that's right. their job. And they're like, they're asking you too, like, well, what do we got to right. do here and this and that? And then, um, but, or so, yeah, sorry. What is, well, the, I was just curious, like what, what, how can somebody else who's filming a project with a big fight scene mm -hmm. be set up for success? And like, what did you do to make sure that that was uh, a, a successful production? Yeah. The, well, I will say that when we first got into it, like the first take of where kind of everybody's out there and it's like, it got a little out of hand <laughs> for a minute. And then like they had a, you know, AD, and the PAs had to rein it in. Be like, guys, you know, we are filming a movie here. Yeah. You know, when we call cut, everybody shut up. <laughs> you know, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like, and everybody's in it. There's a lot of like, um, you know, testosterone in there. And it's just like, it's real. Stuntmen doing too scenes. much. Yeah. And then they're hurting each other for yeah. real. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, there's really no specific advice. It, it would just be, I mean, for a movie, different for commercials, but for a movie, it's, it's like, you really want to think about what you want to think about your ins and your outs of your scenes, like how you're going to get in, how you're going to get out. And then like your feelings within those and like how, you know, how all that's supposed to feel and play, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, so the, this whole aesthetic of this movie was like, it's supposed to feel raw, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And so like there are scenes we cut out because they ended up being too polished. Like we used the jib and it was just too smooth. It just didn't fit, you know? So these, this, this one was just kind of like feel it, you know, and then we would kind of see it and modify as we went. So it was kind of, you know, loosey goosey like that. But, um, for big scenes, like on commercials and stuff like that, generally the, those are pretty dang planned out just yeah. because they kind of have to be yeah. there's so much money involved with clients and agencies and everything. Sick, man. Well, I got, I got a question totally outside the box, but yeah. in your opinion, Besides being able to emulate um, another another project, what is something that makes someone a good DP? Uh, knowing how to light. A lot of, there's a lot of DPs that don't know how to light anything. Mm. Yeah. Can you expand on like? <laughs> yeah, like. Um, well, I like think, how can someone? I mean, obviously, like DP or, or like lighting is that like? Well, the I'll core just say, of, well, I guess like basically, you know, the more the longer you do it. And then the basically with experience comes like the bigger fixtures, all right? Learning about all those. That's intimidating when you start getting into those at first, you know? And things are changing these days now because everything's, you know, who knows in five years, Aperture may be making 18Ks or something. Right. But, mm. um, you know, there's just so many categories of DPs. And the ones that I really respect um, are are sort of the tech, the real technical ones. Like, you know, one of the hardest things you can do is, is to say, shoot, say a four or five person talking scene outdoors in the sunlight over the course of a whole day. Cause it's near the sun is moving. Yeah. And then make it all cut together correctly right. and like do it in the, the legit way. Like that's super hard, you know? And like, GPs that can do that, I have a big respect, you know, or, or things like that, you know, just that sort of people don't realize how hard stuff is really to, to make at that level of, you know, professionalism. Like most people can get a cool camera and make something cool, you know, and a few lights or whatever. Like it's not that hard these days. Um, but you know, that sort of thing is just, is another level, you know, so that, that's the stuff I, I really like. Um, I feel like a lot of times when I'm talking to filmmakers who are on the come up, like one of the main thing, the two main things that I always get asked are how do you color and how do you light? Mm -hmm. And those are like the two things that people always ask me the most. They never ask me about cameras and lenses and stuff like that. It's like, how can I color better? How can I light better? Yeah. And so on the vein of lighting better, 
what advice do you have? I mean, obviously you can get out there and just go shoot and that's like a, you know, a a typical answer, but what advice would you have for people who want to learn how to light better, but are struggling? Yeah. Well, there's, you know, there's so many online sources available now that have a lot of good stuff like wandering DP, you know, is a great resource. If you're really like that type of learner, I'll say this though, like as in depth as wandering DP is and as technical as he is, A lot of times for people that are starting, not even just starting out, because it's like it's like beyond starting out, but, you know, it's still a little too technical. Like you're not, I don't know, I just think like there's no shortcut for experience really. Like there's really no, um, like you're not going to sit there and break out your little book and like start calculating your <clears throat> light loss f-stop percentages with this rag versus that rag. This is like that doesn't happen in the real world on set. Like it. It's like, you just got to know what it does. You know what I mean? Or if you don't, you know, you're working with a gaffer that does and you can, that's what, you know, you can get by, you can, I mean, you, you can get by doing big stuff as a DP, as long as you have a good team, because you really, you don't have to know a lot about lighting. You can be general. If you're working with gaffers, you can be like, I want a big soft light over there and some hard light over here and make it look good. Like you can do that. Yeah. I don't do that. I'm very specific. Right. But, um, People definitely do that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's good, man. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, uh, I'm kind of like the opposite. I'm like, I want this there with yeah. this rag on it, this right. brightness, take this, you know, right. I'm almost like too specific. Well, sometimes. in my mind, like almost all DPs should be gaffers, you know what yeah. I mean? Like they should know yeah. like what rags they want to use, what lights they want to use, how they want to light a scene. Um, and, and typically like the way that I lean on my gaffer is telling him like, Hey, this is my idea and how it would be the easiest to execute this idea. Typically I'm flexible, you know, unless I think Mm -hmm. they're just going to like totally break something, but if it's exactly what I do, but if they're like, Hey, uh, or if I'm like, Hey, I want this big soft source coming from here. And I think that a 12 by, you know, using X, Y, and Z is Mm -hmm. at 10, 12 feet away or whatever is going to be the best way to achieve it. And I explain that to them. And then I say, you know, almost like, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, like, yeah. do you have an easier way that you want to achieve this mm-hmm. or are you on board and let's hash it out so that we can, you know, make this the most efficient thing possible. Yeah. And instead of rigging four lights to key, like, Oh, you, you know what I mean? You got this one or whatever it yeah, is, yeah. you know, I think so. that's one big thing for up and coming DPs as you start to get bigger and you start to work with real gaffers, you know, a variety, you know, cause they're all people, they are all very different um, personality wise. <clears throat> and what, like as a DP, like you're not just like the guy who can operate the camera good and make cool shots and do so it's like you're ahead of a department. So you have to be a people person. You have to know how to interact with people and know how to communicate with them in their style. You know, there's like, I work with different gaffers differently because I know the way they work and what they like and what they don't like. And, you know, I know, you know, who I can be frank with, who I have to, you know, maybe say something a little more walk in, on a, eggshells. in a subtle way too. I don't yeah. have to walk on eggshells anymore because I'm the boss, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's a quote right there. <laughs> but, you know, but you have to learn that. You have yeah. to learn that confidence. You know, I wasn't always like that, but now, now I am, you know. But yeah, I mean, there's some gaffers that don't like to be told specific fixtures, um, you know, and they'll say that, they're like, well, you, you know, just let me, tell me what you want now, you know. Um, but I, you know, I always will be specific and then I always will say what you just said. But if, you know, if you want to change a fixture or something like that, unless I have a reason to be like, no, I want this one exactly, mm-hmm. then I'll say that, you know, but, um, but you know, you're generally working with people that know what they're doing. Right. So it's right. like, you're not like having to hold their hand, you know, you can, if you need to be like, Hey, I don't know, just like this thing. I'll be back in 30 minutes. You know, yeah. I don't do that, but I have done that. <laughs> you know, it does right, happen right. sometimes. It's uh, awesome, man. Yeah. Well, dude, I always love getting to connect with other DPs, picking their brain and seeing how they do stuff. I think just, you know, sharing, uh, you know, a little bit on how you do what you do and, and whatnot. It helps us um, do our jobs better at the end of the day and gives us a, a broader perspective. And so we appreciate your time yeah, and just fun. pouring into the pod, man. Before we get you out of here, we got five questions that cool. we'd like to ask all of our guests. And so my first question for you is, if you could go back and do it all again differently in your career, what is one thing that you would change? I would focus more on my career. Um, I would have focused more on my career earlier. So like in my twenties, 
So I graduated probably halfway through my 20s. I was like 24 or so. But I didn't really get, I mean, I, wor- I was working in the industry and doing stuff, like I said, you know, on my own, plus corporate stuff, from, plus some TV stuff. But like, I didn't really get like real serious and hardcore about work until my early 30s. And I wish I would have done that sooner, you know. Um, so that's one thing I would do is like, just go hard early on. You know what I mean? Um, I had lots of interests. So I was really into music at the time. So I was kind of split yeah. my interests, you know? Yeah. But, um, I just always wonder like if I would have started five years earlier, you know, what would but, happen? Yeah. yeah. But, um, I also think we, like with, I think it's like this for a lot of people from just talking to people and reading things, but it seems like as a DP, like if you're going to stick with it and it's like, you're going to try to be a DP for the long haul. It's like your career, you know, is like this for a long time and it'll go up a little bit. And then all of a sudden, after a while, it'll go, it'll be a big jump. You know what I mean? And like, but you got to like put in that work in order to have that happen. And, you know, it's like, I don't know what else I would do, you know, like, you know, I, yeah. I would do something else, but I like it. It's a great job. It's technical and yeah. creative, you know, and when you're on a job, that's cool. Um, and you're making it and you're making it with friends and you're getting paid like, man, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to rabbit trail us too much, but I gotta, I, you've mentioned this twice and, uh, and Bella, our, uh, intern producer over there for the show, she found a Dallas observer article about a band you were in. Yeah. So tell me what was the band name? And, uh, uh is, br- yeah, yeah. It was a uh, bridges and blinking lights. We were out of Denton, Texas. We're together probably 10, what was it, 10 years? Maybe not 10 years, eight years, something like that. But um, yeah, so that was a big part of my life in in my 20s as I was working and bartending. Mm-hmm. Um, Were you playing uh, like post-2005? Like would I mm-hmm. have, been, I might have We broke up in then. 2008, I think Okay, it was. dude, yeah. I was I was out in the in the yeah. scene, so I, I, I yeah. probably had seen y'all at some yeah, point. Yeah, That's we crazy, played, isn't We it? played often, so yeah, you probably did. Yeah. We played all around, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Denton. That's awesome, man. Um, uh, is, there, is there music still out there that um, people could go and It's not on, uh, it's funny, streaming. the drummer just the, texted me, and I haven't talked to him in a while, like the other day, and was like, hey, can you get our stuff on you know, all the streaming stuff. And I was like, I'll look into it. But yeah, it's, it's not, it's not like on Spotify or anything right now. It, I mean, I know that our Facebooks and stuff are still up. Maybe there's stuff on there. I'm not sure, but cool. That's yeah. awesome, man. We'll put it. Actually, one of your fans uploaded like one song on YouTube. On YouTube? That's okay. So yeah, yeah. I get every now and then I'll get a random email and it, sometimes it's from like across the world and like, Hey, could you, s- you still Dang. have a CD of this? And I do. So I send it to him. Yeah. That's, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. We'll put a link to the, the <laughs> Facebook out. page. Uh, that, that's cool, man. I had to side, <laughs> sidebar that. Love yeah, it, yeah. man. What excites you the most about the current film industry or market? Man, everything is changing right now. So I'd say it's just um, the whole industry is exciting right now because it's mm-hmm. all in flux. Like every part of it is in flux from the unions to just a workflow to technology. Like we're in the middle of this giant change that like 10 years from now we'll, we'll look back and be like, Oh yeah, that's when it all started. Mm. That's when that big, like kind of, you know, new thing, whatever it is, new era we're in started. Um, so yeah, I think it's all pretty exciting right now. Cause it's just like nothing is static right now at all. Yeah, yeah. love point. that, man. And then, and then with with like actual content, you know, you watch. It's like, well, where else can? It's like these are like the most aesthetically pleasing movies and commercials I've ever seen. You know, it's just like, where? What else can you do? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's been so elevated. Like, it's crazy how like commercials now have been elevated to like cinema quality, right. and then cinema is just going like crazy cool. You know, with like lots of cool kind of like younger guys coming in, or just like innovative stuff, like. Yeah, I love the new Batman movie. Like, yeah, super cool. It's just like that sort of stuff, you know. Like that just wouldn't fly like ten years ago. They'd be like, yeah. "What is this craziness?" Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Um. So yeah, I don't know. I think it's all pretty, pretty interesting. sick. Yeah, love it, man. What is one piece of advice that you can give to filmmakers trying to grow in their craft or their business? I think the biggest advice I could give you is that it is really a people business. So, mm-hmm. man, if you're the type that is just like amazing artist and just like everything you touch turns to gold and you just sit at home and don't meet anybody you will go nowhere mm-hmm. it is all about yeah. meeting people Love i mean it. you have to have work to back it up but if you can do those two things then 
and it's like, I mean, I s- still struggle with this constantly. You know, it's just like, man, I mean, you see some young guys out there just like networking, hustling, all this stuff. And you're just like, oh, I should probably be doing some more of that. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Always. I man. love it, man. Struggle um, is real. Yeah. <laughs> Where are we as an industry headed in filmmaking and what should we be focusing on? Hmm. Interesting. I think I think we're going to have a resurgence of um, really authentic feeling media, meaning everything has gotten so polished and slick and stylized, you know, that I think there's going to be the reaction, which is the opposite. Mm. So I think you'll see a lot of like, um, not right away, like it'll still be a minute, but I think eventually maybe the next few years you'll start to see a drive m- towards like big brands shooting on film again and doing like very intimate human, very human feeling. Like everything is going to get so artificial and so over the top and so glitzy glamoury and, you know, everything looks amazing and everything's got special effects and blah, blah, that there's going to be a backlash against that, Mm. you know, Mm. and all starts with the young people usually. And that's already sort of started already. Um, And it's interesting if you talk to agency people too, because that's the whole deal with like now, you know, instead of hiring Mr superstar they're going to the brand the, you know the 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 tiktok chick or whatever uh, right. you know what Influencers. I mean? right, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah and then all that stuff has already gotten so like overly fake that like the stuff that's trending more now is even more like even you know more real so anyway i don't know if i'm right but i feel like there's going to be a push against all this at some point film's going to have a resurgence and just sort of the either that and or there's also going to be some whole new medium that, mm. you know, we don't really know about or have much involvement in yet. Mm. Who knows what that's going to be, you know? Dude, I, we've, we've actually have clients that have, you know, starting to trend in that direction already. Like, hey, hey, we want we want to do this project. We want to do it with you. But we don't want it to look as good yeah. as you've and done Part before. of that is probably like, you know, because it'll be cheaper too. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> but, but it's the TikTok and the, and the, you know, it's all the social content because they, they go... We don't want to over. It's the overproduced. Yeah, that's what the that's the the words you know, and it's and I get it because like mm-hmm. some of the con. I mean, some of the most uh, viral content look. You know, it's iPhone footage and it's you know a little four year old holding the mm-hmm. camera. Yeah. You know, and so well, I've been on several world. big shoots. Um, you know, in this last year where you know we have a guy out or we have like a shot we're supposed to do for TikTok or something, mm. and like I did an Under Armour thing and we were going to do it on the mini. Like, we shoot the whole commercial, and then they're like, hey, do this TikTok thing, flip it on its side. And started doing that, and then the other guy was doing it. It was a, there was two DPs on it. He was doing that. And then he just started using his phone, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. this camera looks too nice. Let's pull out the iPhone, yeah. yeah. The other thing, too, that I would add to that is I feel like an iPhone creates relatability And actual cinema cameras create credibility. Sure. And so like whenever you're trying to make relatable content, sometimes the iPhone is just a better choice camera to execute on that if that's your mission. And so like if you're making like social media, like, you know, value add content, sometimes you got to just shoot it on an iPhone instead of an Alexa Mini. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) yeah, totally. I mean, they'll, they'll they'll be more of that where they'll try to do this hybrid thing where it's like, Yes, we are using, you know, this and that, but we want it to be, you know, in still good rates, but you're going to be yeah. using these things. Or who knows? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I haven't done a lot of that, but it definitely happens. And it seems like it kind of comes in waves. Like there'll be like three or four shoots where that there's always sort of some element of that happening and then it'll go away. It seemed like for a minute there, everything had a vertical video aspect to it. Right. Like, oh, we're going to do a vertical crop too, a vertical crop also. So I always had to shoot open gate and all this I haven't had to do that a lot lately. I don't yeah. Know why. Mm. A lot of times I try if I can to find out the distribution like in advance and like, oh, yeah. is this just going to Instagram? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Because if it is, I'm just going to turn the, ver- the camera vertical the whole time. Mm-hmm. If it's never going to see YouTube. Yeah. For uh, sure. Cause you can just frame up the shot better. You don't have to crop anything. It's great. So yeah. Who is one filmmaker that you admire and why? Mm, I think the first, the guy that kind of got me interested in film was, um, David Lynch. Uh, whenever I was in high school, the, my film professor, my video tech guy played us a racer head. Yeah. Mm. And I was, had never seen anything like that before. Had never heard of David Lynch. And so it was like, what is this craziness? And then like saw some other movie of his. And then that kind of, that's what got me into like 
oh, like other, you know, movies that weren't, you know, in the theater yeah. or on TV or whatever. And like this, the whole other world of stuff that you never knew existed until, you know, you know, yeah. um, so he's kind of like my old, my old guy that got, you know, got me into it. Um, yeah. and I still like a lot of his stuff. I think, uh, a lot of his magical realism or sort of these, you know, where things sort of happen that are unexplained that is sort of a theme in a lot of his work. It's kind of, I'm kind of into like that sort of stuff. I think it's really cool. Um, I think life's like that, you know, it's like nothing's ever really explained in life and weird shit happens constantly, Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? <laughs> so I kind of like that when movies sort of incorporate that. Um, but yeah, so. It's awesome, yeah, man. It's good one. What is next for you and what are some of your goals, man, that you're pursuing, man? Um, next for me is going, not, not this, not next week, but the following week I'm going to, um, Santa Barbara and then Vancouver for a nice. job for Yeti. So that'd be cool. Sick. And then, um, after that I'm unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> well, bro, we have, uh, we've really appreciated your time, man. Thank you for coming by the studio, dropping knowledge Absolutely. gems on us. And it's always, like I said, great to connect with other DPs who are out here doing, living the dream man, yeah. and connecting here and how they do <laughs> what they do and, uh, pouring back into the community, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Well, this has been an amazing episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Rough Cut Club.